Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Monk School. My name is Peter Lowen. I'm the Associate Director for Global Engagement at the Monk School of Global Affairs. Um, and today I'm joined by Simon Jackman, CEO of the U.S. Study Center at the University of Sydney. Uh, before I introduce Simon, I do want to acknowledge that the University of uh, the land on which the University of Toronto um, operates has been for uh, thousands of years the home of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And today it's the home for people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to work on this uh, work and live on this land. Um, Simon Jackman is, uh, as I said, the CEO of the U.S. Studies Center at the University of Sydney. He's a professor of political science, um, and he's uh, the perfect guest to walk us through the implications of the most recent U.S. election for um, allies of the United States. Simon has long lived in uh, in two worlds. He was a professor of political science at Stanford um, for a long time. While he was there, he was twice the co-principal investigator of the American National Election Study. He is in summary, one of the most important, I think, analysts and scholars of American politics and American public opinion. So he lives in that world. Um, and he's also one of the leading, uh, I would say public intellectuals at uh, uh, in Australia. And he's doing a lot of work to, um, uh, this may sound familiar to Canadians, to help a country which has long been an ally of the United States, figure out how to navigate a world in which the United States is not the only power um, and in which allies are uh, uh, sometimes friends and sometimes in tension with the, with the uh, United States. So it's great to have Simon here as a person who's got lines of sight into the United States. Um, into uh, countries that have important relationships, uh, democratic countries that have important relationships with the United States, um, and, uh, and someone who is just uh, more generally, uh, I think, a very savvy analyst of, uh, of politics in the short and the long term. So, Simon, it's great to have you with us. Uh, I'll turn it over to you to, uh, to, to let us know what we should know about long term and immediate implications of this U.S. election, and then let's have a chat about uh, what you're seeing. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction, Peter. Um, that's that's uh, the introduction you wish your mother could hear. Thank you, um, <laughs> um, um, and and thank you for this opportunity uh, to talk to uh, your group there uh, at the Monk School. Um, I've, I've been there physically uh, in in the past. I remember giving a talk up there after Obama's re-election in in twelve, and, and I've had a few other occasions to to come up and either work with Peter. Or colleagues up at up at UT, um, and, and I wish I was there in person. Um, uh, sort of missing the Northern Hemisphere a lot as um, uh, Australia has been deep locked down. International travel is essentially prohibited, uh, and indeed interstate travel within Australia has essentially been very difficult as well. Um, but uh, Australia's had a very good result, uh, comparatively speaking, on COVID. But um, it would be great for a scholar of the United States to be able to get back to the United States at, at, at some point, but Zoom will we'll have to do uh, for now. And the um, same goes for a trip to Canada as well. Um, and, and let me also, uh, Peter, um, just also acknowledgement of country is a uh, um, the way we open events here as well. And, and, um, and uh, here at the University of Sydney, um, uh, we, we, we're on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people um, who uh, were part of the Eora Nation of pe First Peoples here around uh, the Sydney uh, area. And um, we pay uh, our respects here at the US Study Centre to, to Gadigal elders uh, past, present and emerging. And I think that's great to hear that an acknowledgement of First Peoples is, is is part of the ordinary order of uh, events for, like these in Canada as it is in Australia. Um, uh, it, that wasn't the case when I left Australia for my time in the United States, but it is now the case um, that I'm back home here in Australia and it's a, it's a long overdue. Um, let, let's turn to the matter at hand. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the US election, first of all, wearing my um, US politics um, public opinion analyst hat first. But I do want to pivot pretty quickly um, to my day job now, and, and that is uh, leading a research institute that is charged literally by the Australian government and other stakeholders here in Australia with helping understand America and trends in the United States as they complement or sometimes uh, cut across uh, Australian uh, national interests. Um, and I think that that was a very helpful frame that I chose to put around this talk for a Canadian audience. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that 
sort of those points of commonality between an Australian perspective and perhaps what might be on the minds of Canadian observers of US politics at this at this moment as well. We'll do that a little bit later. But first of all, the election per se. Well, look, the first thing to observe is is the is the uh, the fact that an incumbent <laughs> a, a, an incumbent lost, uh, and that's a rare event um, historically speaking in American politics. Um, and, um, and, I, and I'm going to emphasize that uh, for a reason. Um, so let's just review the historical record. Um, who, who has lost their bid for re-election in, in, say, the last 100 years of American um, politics? Or you'd say George H.W. Bush, um, Jimmy Carter. You might say Gerald Ford, although, right, he was appointed to be VP and then from there got the presidency. He was never elected president in his own right or not, not, and wasn't even elected vice president. Um, before that, you've got to go um, uh, back, a, back a long way uh, to Herbert Hoover. Um, so FDR, Truman, Eisenhower, um, uh, Kennedy's assassinated, um, and, and we know the rest of the history. Uh, Johnson doesn't seek re-election in '68, and so you might put an asterisk on that one. Uh, Nixon, uh, and then and then that recent history. I put so Trump goes into a pretty rare club. Uh, first of all, um, <clears throat> now I put that on the table only because there's been so much media attention on the fact um, that he. Oh, but what about the 70 million people that voted for Trump? Uh, never before have we seen that many votes cast for um, um, for um, a, a losing president. Yeah, but the fact is, he lost, um, and he <clears throat> he lost the popular vote by a pretty huge margin. Um, pretty bigger, it'll turn out, I think, than the margin that he lost to Hillary Clinton in the popular vote in um, in 2016. The only thing that makes this election close is this peculiar. American institution of the Electoral College, whereby um, Trump narrowly lost in four or five states that will turn out to be pivotal, Pennsylvania, um, Arizona, Georgia, um, Nevada, perhaps, depending on how you want to do the math. But, but just as his win in 2016 turned on about 77,000 votes spread across the three most marginal states, Biden's win will end up being about 80 to 100,000 votes spread across uh, about, again, about three states. And Biden has the same electoral college count, 306, um, that, that Trump had in, in 2016. So there's an awful lot of attention on how close it was. And indeed, in that strictly formal, legal, institutional sense, it was close. But um, in terms of where the country is at as a whole, um, I think it's an important thing to put into the mix Again, this is starting to get into my day job of trying to make sense of the United States um, for, for an Australian audience that can't believe that it was a close election. Um, it won't come as a surprise to perhaps this audience that uh, Trump is extremely on the nose um, here in Australia. We ran a survey, um, about 25 to 30% of Australians said they'd like to see Trump elected to a second term. You can't find a single demographic group in Australia where Trump enjoys majority support, at least not easily. We found kind of voters for fringe right parties in Australia were about the only slice of the Australian electorate where we could find majority support for a Trump second term. Um, I saw the Canadian foreign minister doing a little research for this talk. The Canadian foreign minister was quoted as saying, you know, a sigh of relief and, and welcoming, and it's a great result for Canada that Trump lost. The Australian government was nowhere, no one in, a, in, a, in an official position was anywhere near that that uh, uh, that buoyant or, or that or that ebullient about about a uh, about Trump's loss. Um, much more measured remarks uh, from the Australian government. They were quick to acknowledge uh, Joe Biden as president-elect, but with and, and welcoming. Uh, sort of looking forward to working with the Biden administration, but none of this, this is a, great, a good result uh, uh, for Australia. And, and to some extent, that's to do with the ideological affinities uh, between the current Australian government, a right of centre government and, uh, and the Trump administration. And indeed, I'll come to that a little bit later um, as well. Some of the, the way I think Australia's relationship with the United States under Trump um, is kind of very different to Canada's, frankly, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. 
Um, but the other thing to take away from the election um, is the fact that Trump had coattails. So Trump has lost um, um, the presidency and, and, and lost the, the national popular vote by a lot. And indeed, uh, when was the last time a Republican candidate for president won uh, the popular vote? Uh, answer uh, George W. Bush beating John Kerry uh, in 04. Uh, and before that, now you've got to go back to Ronald Reagan in 88. Uh, uh, sorry, pardon me. Um, Bush beating Dukakis in 88, pardon me. Um, Republicans um, have not uh, won a plurality and certainly not a majority of the national popular vote uh, for a while. And it's that um, electoral college, um, one of a couple of institutions in American politics that confer outsized power on, my, on the minority. And, and again, I think that's an important, if you want to understand the United States, you've got to have the electoral institutions front of mind, um, not only the electoral college, but the Senate, which I was about to talk about. So as you all know, the United States Senate gives each state two senators. That is a constitutionally mandated form of malapportionment. Uh, California has two senators, the same as Wyoming, and each of the Dakotas and and, and all those small states um, have, have two senators. You throw on top a, uh, a the uh, the filibuster, uh, the requirement on on not everything, but on many things requiring 60 votes to bring debate to a close. Uh, that confers enormous power uh, on on these small states. And right now the mapping from geography to political preferences is such that that is a huge sort of tilt um, towards, um, you know, the median voter, if you will, the swing vote in the United States Senate um, sits at, on the left flank of an of a, of a, of a outsized conservative majority relative to where uh, American public opinion is. Um, a similar argument holds for the House of Representatives, largely, again, a bit of small state bias uh, creeping in there, um, but but also partisan gerrymandering. So these institutions um, confer or delivering outsized amounts of political power, uh, disproportionate amounts of political power uh, to conservative voices in in American politics, the Electoral College, the Senate, and the House. Now, um, now, why am I bringing that up? Because uh, what Trump did, despite losing the presidency, was to deliver a pretty amazing result, frankly, for uh, Republican Senate candidates in particular and, and House candidates. So Biden comes to power um, for it's the first time a Democratic president has come to power uh, without a, a, a majority in the Senate, I believe, uh, since since Truman in 48. Um, it's he's lost seats. That's very unusual, too, for even the House majority, the Democratic majority in the Senate to go down. And uh, um, so Republicans have picked up eight, maybe uh, even more, about roughly halving the majority that Pelosi had. Um, now, why am I bringing this up? All this tempers the ability for Biden to deliver on elements of the agenda that he talked about, both domestic, but also and now getting closer to, the, to some of the matters I do want to talk about um, our foreign policy as well. Um, I do not believe that the Georgia uh, Senate runoffs are going to change matters at all. Um, um, the air has gone out of the balloon now that Trump has been uh, defeated. Um, the people more enlivened uh, to participate in the Georgia Senate runoffs um, will be Republicans uh, or, and Trump loyalists seeking to redress the, the grave injustice that the presidential election delivered to President Trump. Um, Democrats, it will be very hard. Stacey Abrams down there in Georgia is a political phenomenon. Um, the way they turned Georgia blue in the presidential election, a remarkable accomplishment. Um, I just am extremely skeptical that that same coalition and the energy required to deliver, to turn Georgia blue can be repeated without the presence of Donald Trump as a mobilizing factor for Democrats in in. Uh, those runoff elections in Georgia, and that the state more or less reverts to type. And, and the two, um, I think I think Republicans go a two for two in both of the Georgia seats that are up for runoff elections. Um, and so if that's the case, and I'm, I'm, I'm extremely 
confident in that call, um, then the Senate remains in Republican hands. So Biden has got a a House majority in Democratic uh, Democratic House majority, but one that will be a little bit nervous uh, looking ahead to the midterms, where traditionally the party of the president goes backwards, uh, and there isn't a lot of margin there to work with, number one. Uh, number two, um, um, uh, Biden does not have the Senate. That won't be a problem, I believe, for cabinet appointments. Um, I believe the picks are, and we'll, we'll get into some of them in a moment, are, are, are quite moderate. Um, they, if even if McConnell, the majority Republican majority leader in the, in the Senate, wanted to be very, very obstructionist um, and, and just no to everything and a, a sort of a narrative about the Democrats having stolen the election and it's all illegitimate and, and no way are we playing ball. Um, I, I believe that the picks we've got um, would attract some defections from moderate Republicans, such as Mitt Romney, uh, Susan Collins from Maine, um, and, and, and Biden's picks are all going to get through. Um, I think that there's supply and demand at work there. Um, I, I think particularly the Secretary of State nomination, Tony Blinken over Susan Rice. I think Rice would probably have had a, a torrid, torrid um, confirmation struggle. Uh, all the allegations about her role in the Benghazi affair under then Secretary of State Clinton uh, and indeed when she was National Security Advisor in the Obama administration would be would be all game on and Biden doesn't want that fight. That'd be a tough vote even for Mitt Romney and, and Susan Collins and the like. So why have that fight now? And, and hence Tony Blinken and we'll come back to Tony Blinken in, in, in just a second. Um, but all that means is that some of the more um, ambitious elements of the Biden agenda, I think, are, are not going to be realised. Um, in particular, one thing in Australia we were paying an awful lot of attention to was Biden's uh, promised $1.7 trillion US dollars over 10 years spend on climate change, uh, injecting that into renewables in particular. I think that is dead on arrival in a Republican Senate. A, a mini-sized version of that might get up um, in, in budget reconciliation. You could easily see a, a Democratic House being enthusiastic for it. Um, a Republican-controlled Senate says no way. Um, but a, a, a very, a very watered-down version of that comes through. Um, uh, and so things like that, I, I think... Uh, uh, aren't, aren't likely uh, to, to bear fruit, at, particularly in these first two years. There is a slight chance. It, it's, it's, again, 2022 will be an interesting cycle for Senate Republicans. You keep in mind that U.S. senators are elected on six-year terms. So if you're up in 22, that means you're elected in 16, um, which was a good year. Trump uh, won that year. So it's that those Trump coattail Republican senators are up in, in 22, uh, and there may be some upside um, chances there for Dems, but in 22, could they take the Senate? Could they flip two seats uh, not, and not lose any of their own? Um, we'll see. Um, are people already, already thinking about 2022? Welcome to American politics. The next election is never that far away. Um, um, but, but I think um, um, for the time being, um, dramatically scale back on on the ambition of the domestic policy agenda. And indeed, you know, I think, look, issue number one through five is COVID. Um, and and so, um, um, and, and stimulus um, on the, so you got the public health challenge um, and you've got the economic challenge of COVID. And I think domestically, that's just where uh, the attention will be. So a little, a few, a few thoughts about that before the foreign policy stuff. Um, very quickly, um, um, uh, uh, COVID, Biden's likely to catch a break in that he will come to office with a vaccine right behind him. Um, um, and I think that's more likely than not at this point. And indeed, I think equity markets are already pricing that in and the accompanying economic um, recovery that comes in. And, and, you know, he just gave a very set of somber remarks as president-elect just a, a few hours ago uh, about the need for patience and, and uh, social distancing to be maintained through the Thanksgiving uh, holiday this 
today. Uh, well, today it's Thursday here in Australia, but but the next couple of days uh, in in um, in the United States and into the holidays per se, uh, with the vaccine more likely to arrive, you know, um, in the new year. But his first quarters as U.S. president will be as the vaccine or vaccines plural, and and you know, touch wood that they are as effective as these trials suggest. Um, and uh, they get rolled out. And what a what a remarkable, um, what a great political gift to him that would be, uh, if that were the case. Um, um, and and I think he will get a lot of political sort of tailwind uh, out of that. And that that could augur well for compelling Republicans to cooperate where they can, particularly on COVID recovery, uh, as it's clear that the public health story is um, is is starting to. Uh, improve. And indeed, we may even see action on that before um, um, through the lame duck Congress. Um, it, it's, and that gets me back to Trump, last observation about Trump. It's very unusual. Like, what does he do, not just now in the lame duck, and there'll be all this explosive stuff about pardons and weird one-off decisions already, a few of them about uh, appointments and, and elements of defense policy that are sort of very odd. Um, um, but does he green light essentially give republicans permission to play ball with biden on a COVID relief package that could get passed between now and uh, through what we call in american politics the lame duck congress um congress sits um is is, is in office there's no sort of parliamentary recess um, um as, as we have in westminster style election congress is still there still sitting and and literally um, and sometimes in the past, the old Congress sits right up to the end and literally the next morning, the new Congress is sworn in um, and it's just one day to the next almost. Um, it's been that way sometimes in the past. Um, um, there's still opportunity for this Congress and the Senate um, to, um, to try and get some COVID relief done. Um, Trump has unusual, the, the thing about Trump is just this, the, the power he has for losing, and I go back to where I started on the domestic politics observation, for losing um, a president, uh, this great historical ignominy that he, that, he, that he faces, amazing stock of political power. And that's what all this argy-bargy about um, the election dispute's about. This is him building a narrative to sustain his political capital to be deployed either for monetary gain or political gain or both down the line. The question is, what does he do with it? How does he still command the loyalty of the Republican base and hence the fear of Republican members of Congress and, and senators? Um, it's just remarkable. He will leave office almost unlike any other losing president um, Jimmy Carter was not able to wield <laughs> influence over the Democratic House during the first term of Reagan. The Democrats, right? Losing the presidency is like so long bye-bye. Uh, the old Saturday Night Live, if you're old enough to remember Dana Carvey's great impersonation of George H.W. Bush um, as a one-termer um, and, and wouldn't want to be a one-termer. Um, um, there's nothing sadder in American politics. It's, politics to uh, be a, a one-term U.S. president. But Trump is, like in so many respects, so unusual. The amount of power he has now still and may have in the future and is likely to have in the future. And for all the talk of the country trying to unite around Biden, it takes two to unite. I can't compel you to unite with me. <laughs> um, um, Biden can 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 make all the lofty speeches he he likes, but at some point, Trump still has cards to play as this cult leader, almost the status he has in American politics and culture at the moment, and and he has his choices to make. So much is up to him. The decisions he makes and what he wants from a um, a life post politics, uh, post presidency rather, perhaps not a life post politics, and that's the point. Um, the, that will be a big handbrake on, uh, and, and it'll be a struggle, I think, inside the Republican Party, who some of whom want to move on from Trump and some of whom are still terrified about his capacity to unleash a primary challenger against you. And exhibit A on that is, is um, Jeff Flake, uh, a senator from Arizona, um, who had a bright political career in front of him, 
um, went from the House uh, to the Senate, a, a relatively conservative member of the House of Representatives, someone who cut funding to the National Science Foundation. Um, and I've, I've gotten to know Jeff Flake in the years since in my new role, but I do remind him of how um, he struck terror into the hearts of social scientists uh, and uh, um, trying to get funding out of the National Science Foundation. Um, those sorts of credentials, um, anti-earmarks, deficit hawk, uh, ferociously pro-American, uh, uh, sort of that center-right uh, sense of American strength in foreign policy in the military, like an Arizona Republican, um, but a, a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints and appalled by uh, some of the things uh, Trump was up to uh, around immigration policy and, and the Brett Kavanaugh nomination in particular and the, and, and the allegations about, about uh, was, was Trump enthralled to the Russians. Well, J Jeff Flake was, was then politically destroyed by Donald Trump who came to Arizona, mobilized the Republican challenger against him and the rest is history. And Jeff, Jeff Flake's political carcass is kind of strung up, I'm sure, in the minds of senators as they enter the Senate chamber in the, in, in the, in the American capital. And, um, and you do not cross Donald Trump because he is capable of unleashing hellfire against you in your primary. And, and, uh, and, and Jeff Flake is, is sort of the mounted moose head um, that, that um, and, 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 and Trump's still got that ability. It's just unparalleled in, in American political history that a losing, a losing US president um, will have that much political power over his party going forward. It's, 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 we're, and so there's no historical precedent for it in um, certainly in the last century um, or more. Um, so, so that's a few observations that I think are good backdrop. Real quickly now, the implication for allies, I know it's already half past the hour. Um, look, what I'm gonna do is just sort of tease for you guys um, a report that, that we, um, we stood up on this here at the US Study Center. Um, and um, this is a publication. Everything I've got to say about this is sort of drawn from this. This was, um, I'm screen sharing um, sort of my web browser showing you the, um, the, um, this report on our website. We stood up this, so, this red book, blue book um, ahead of the election. You see the publication date is, is October. None of these assessments have really changed save for the fact that um, contrary to expectations, um, pre-election expectations, um, um, the Democrats do not have the Senate. And, um, but we wrote this, you know, the way government often commissions from the bureaucracy uh, briefing books on uh, an incoming government brief. We wrote one, an incoming government brief for the Australian government on, on either election scenario. I wrote the overview chapter, but there's an awful lot of content here. Um, and, and let me just touch on, on some of the highlights here um, um, that I think are of, of, of real implication for, um, for not just Australia. Now, obviously, this, is, this document is written for an Australian audience, but I think they are also important for an ally like Canada um, to help understand. There are some things here that generalize. Um, um, the first thing from an Australian perspective, and I think you know, Canada is a, is a, is a, is a like Australia, is a bicoastal uh, nation, uh, Atlantic and Pacific. Here for us, it's Pacific and Indian Ocean. Um, but the Pacific um, has been elevated as a strategic theater uh, under, the, under the Trump years, and not necessarily because of Trump, but because of, of China as well. And, and of course, Canada has its own sort of interesting recent history with China. And I don't need to remind um, you guys about this, but the point being that don't mistake the United States mindset under Trump with respect to China and all this talk about strategic competition and great power rivalry and uh, decoupling. Um, don't mistake that for being Trump specific. Um, that is, was cemented under Trump and blossomed and came out into the open, but is now is bipartisan orthodoxy uh, in, in Washington. Um, um, there is a generation um, or generations plural 
anybody in strategic affairs in the United States understands what is the 21st century about or the next couple of decades of the 21st century. It's about a competition for global primacy between China and the West with two very different models of political economy on offer. Uh, one um, um, authoritarian, uh, a one-party state, a st strong mechanicalist state um, with, with global ambition, um, and, and the other being a, a, the Western model, um, free markets, uh, liberal institutions, um, uh, countries pursuing their national interests in competition with one another, sometimes in concert, but with rules of the road, um, sort of laying down how that competition uh, takes place. Um, uh, and, and each of those countries committed to uh, democracy as an internal form of organization. Um, um, all this is set against, um, obviously, trends in technology and whatnot. We're in a very interesting moment. We've had to sort of go back to the IR uh, textbooks and invent words for it. But, um, you know, we live in a world where uh, of, of geoeconomic competition is perhaps the, is the, and I think it is broadly understood in the United States now, Democrats and Republicans, that that competition between the United States and its allies and China is, is what the game, the great game of the 21st century is about. Uh, the post-Cold War unipolar moment uh, uh, was, was a brief one. Um, the challenges that were thrown up sort of through the 90s and particularly after 9-11 uh, with state failure, ethnic conflict, uh, counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, and um, that is over um, or is less priority number one and now perhaps priority number two or three or even four. Um, the great challenges facing the world uh, is this huge multi-domain, multi-dimensional competition uh, between um, uh, authoritarian states, principally China, but, but to some extent Russia as well, um, and, um, and the United States and its Western uh, democratic partners and allies. Um, the, the thing that's different about Biden is that the way I think there's an understanding that the way to prosecute the case um, is in concert with allies, that American first foreign policy isn't going to work. Um, China, we're too far down the runway and, and sort of a strictly realist interpretation would be that China is too big and too powerful for any one country uh, um, to be able to uh, coordinate and uh, a response to it too big and the challenges are too multidimensional um, and, and alliances are the way uh, to, to make this work um, and the, some, all the existing architecture. So number one, the Five Eyes partnership, which is largely historically an intelligence sharing network, the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, um, but then other formations uh, such as NATO, um, um, the alliances the United States has back in with Asian partners, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, principally, new emerging forms like the Quad, uh, the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. Um, it's, it's this sort of using those alliance networks um, to coordinate the response to China that, that you know, I think many Western governments believe uh, is needed. The US will play a, a coordinating role, but it's hardly going to be going it alone. Um, now, in the short term, I don't see the Biden administration taking its, you know, tariffs were sort of crazy brave and stupid uh, from, from, but even Trump's political enemies, right? They can use all those words to describe what Trump did in, in terms of China policy. But having put China under that kind of pressure, I don't expect to see um, a Biden administration in a huge hurry to back off. Um, I think they're going to understand that Trump, this, this sort of, for all his faults, was the first American president to put China under some real pressure, um, at kind of in a, in a way that is kind of mad um, from one perspective. But having taken the hard decision about tariffs, in particular as a weapon um, of, um, in, the, in, in the locker, of statecraft, um, I think that that stays in place for the time being. While this team, 
beds down a new China strategy, and that is, um, you know, all these different slogans for it. Um, scalpel, more scalpel, less sledgehammer, uh, but critically uh, competition, not confrontation. Now that's got implications as well for I think all the alliance partners like Canada and Australia in particular for the purposes of this conversation. Um, there will be real new domains of the alliances that we have that are intelligence or military, defense, security based are blossoming in terms of their scope. And that's very much in play in the US-Australia alliance. Now, the alliance is becoming a platform on which to stand up um, other things. So, for instance, Australia and the United States under Trump uh, were cooperating on uh, critical supply chains. Uh, it, it began in particular with critical minerals and critical materials. Um, um, sometimes called rare earths, um, but as it turns out, they're not that rare. They're just really hard to, to pull out of the ground. And, and Canada's got tons of those, just like Australia, both resource rich uh, countries. Um, but there's going to be all these op quite opportunistic um, avenues for cooperation that have all these weird commercial sort of footholds and, and they, you know, things that look like would ordinarily be in the domain of commerce. Do we build a mine here? Do we build a mine there? Do we put a plant here or a plant there? The state is back and taking a very keen interest in these sorts of decisions, who's funding them. Um, and indeed, in some cases, explicitly using existing avenues of defense and strategic cooperation uh, to, to do things commercially and Australia's recent moves with the United States on critical materials um, is, is a case in point where literally there are Australian entities are being designated as preferred suppliers into, into US DOD uh, supply chains or supply chains that have the US Department of Defense as the ultimate customer. Um, plenty more of that to come, particularly as I think as the Biden administration goes down the path of looking very hard at decoupling. There are going to be some very tall fences erected around certain sectors of the American uh, technology and industrial base. And there will be trusted partners and the Five Eyes Network, of which Canada is a member, obviously, um, is going to be one of those pathways back in. They're going to be these trusted networks. Um, um, already, um, the Australian government has, hasn't moved too quickly on this to follow the Trump administration, but um, deep, deep scrutiny of research partnerships between Australian higher ed institutions and, and China. I'm not quite sure what that looks like in Canada, but none of that is going to go away under Trump. I think if anything, they become very targeted and they're trying to be helpful to commercial interests and to higher ed um, institutions that are and do need to be global um, but there are new rules of the road already in place out of um, the Trump administration. But that is not going away. There's going to be uh, uh, plenty more um, of, of that. Um, the other issue we have is just, can this administration walk and chew gum? Um, it's a very crowded agenda uh, for the United States um, um, with COVID. And so a few observations. As I said earlier, we expect inertia to be the watchword for the foreseeable future. Um, the retrenchment in, in, in US defense spending isn't going away. And, and that means what the, the term of art for this is burden sharing among the allies. Um, Australia's taken its defense spending um, above the 2% of GDP target that um, the US had been talking to allies about for a long time. Um, um, the Australian government sees this theatre out here, the so-called Indo-Pacific, as just the focus of that strategic competition between China uh, and the United States and is making big, big... Uh, the acceleration in defence spending here is, is something we haven't seen in Australia uh, uh, literally since World War II. Um, um, that, that is sort of how dire some of the medium-term assessments about the rise in China's capabilities, conventional and cyber and, and, and space and um, relative to the medium term trajectory um, and the appetite within the United States for, for global leadership. Um, one thing Trump exposed was sort of exhaustion 
among the American people at the costs, uh, financial, political, social, of, of sustaining global leadership. America first was this, particularly in foreign policy. And the turn away from free trade was as much about that as anything. And, and, and that is, Biden is a, is a globalist, is an internationalist, is a multilateralist, but, but, and, but believes in American power as being a force for good in the world. But it is much more going to fall to doing things in concert with the allies. And that means the allies having to, to spend more uh, and, and, and do more. Um, um, the, the last thing I'll put on the table, uh, because I, I know time is going by very quickly, um, and that is just to observe um, some risks to both Australia and Canada. We are both resource rich countries. Um, uh, decarbonizing our economies is a, is a challenge. Canada is a big spread out country like Australia. Um, uh, resource extraction is a big part of the economy uh, in both places. Um, um, Canada, because of its geography and climate, um, um, you burn a lot of, you need, the economy um, requires a, a lot of energy inputs. And, and Australia, the same way, it's, it's big. It's, the population is dispersed on the coast and, and sustaining a nation, um, just flying from one place to another or shipping goods, um, in, in both of our countries, um, and uh, even right, our domestic economies, forget what our, our trade footprint looks like with, re with respect to uh, 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 carbon, uh, carbon emissions, but just our domestic economies uh, are both, uh, you know, have a big carbon footprint. Um, um, appointing John Kerry International Climate Envoy is, you know, and, and this aspiration to put climate change considerations at the heart and center um, of US domestic policy, but US foreign policy, what's that going to mean? What sort of pressure, frankly, um, is that going to put? And I think, you know, Trudeau has got, um, you know, uh, net zero targets in mind. Australia hasn't gone there. Australia said, we'll, we'll meet our Paris obligations, um, but has not announced targets. And I think, you know, economies uh, that are a little more carbon exposed um, certainly, Australia, it's a big issue here in Australia. Everybody's trying to think about what this might mean. Uh, this centre-right government in Australia goes from, a, from having a Trump administration on its right flank with respect to international climate obligations and, and sort of the general approach to climate change to now having an American government on its left flank. Um, and and that's, that's a big gulp moment as well. And, and no one really quite knows what it might, what it might mean for trade, um, um, number one. Uh, but number two, what it might mean um, for um, um, uh, for, the, for domestic politics uh, in Australia, um, where American public opinion goes, Australian public opinion uh, can't help but but be dragged in, in in that way to some extent. Look, that's more than enough. That's about forty five minutes from me, a bit maybe forty minutes from me, a bit longer than I, I told Peter I would go for. Um, but more than enough, I hope, between the domestic and some of this foreign policy and, and, and what comes next, um, um, I think, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Yes, Simon, thanks very much. It's a very good, uh, that's a very good um, tour, tour of the landscape. Um, if people have questions, you can put them into the, into the, uh, into the Q&A. Um, I just want to, uh, I want to ask a question that I want to, uh, uh, I want to observe something that I'll ask a question. And it's that um, you know, for both Canada and the and Australia, both countries regard their relationship with the United States as their most important uh, uh, foreign relationship. Uh, uh, you know, we the 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 ADM for us is we talk about the the world's longest unprotected border. You talk about the alliance. Um, uh, in both cases, uh, in, in in the Canadian case, there is the sense of Canada having been left out in the cold for the last four years. Yeah. This was um, really two events bring that about, right? One is that we, we have to renegotiate NAFTA. Um, yep. And it was very illustrative of what the kind of the, the, the Trump administration was up to. We basically renegotiated a trade agreement and didn't change all that, didn't change all that much as it turns out. Put, up, put everything on, on the table for a very small pot, right? Um, and then there's the issue of China where, where, the, where the country feels very squeezed by the yep. US request to, to extradite uh, Meng Wanzhou and then the, you know, the subsequent events events from there. 
what's the what's the mood in Australia, and what's the sense of of, of a path forward there for um, navigating the relationship between the United States and China, um, and more than that, just getting things on a more positive footing with the United States, such that it's constructive rather than um, rather than uh, um, playing being very defensive, or is it the case that the last four years haven't been characterized by the same kind of active conflict, and you're just waiting yeah. for the relationship to renew? Yeah, so it's really interesting, Peter. Um, um, where to begin? Um, Australia was the first of the five eyes to ban Huawei and ZTE from its telco network. So, um, and, and indeed, Australia banned Huawei and ZTE from its uh, an initiative to build a, a broadband network. Um, it was an initiative of... Um, Labor government, but under a mm-hmm. Labor government, that decision was taken. Then the most recent one that really upset the Chinese was uh, Australia being the first of the Five Eyes to say no to Huawei and ZTE with Australia's rollout of 5G. Um, and Australia got a lot of credit for that at, in Washington. It was a big, bold step. And indeed, Australia was literally coming to Washington going, look, our, our tech Nicole guys have made this assessment. What do you what do you think? And they went, oh yeah. And um, and you know, senators like hawkish senators like Rubio and Tom Cotton, and you know, you poke people around the national security scene in Washington. Hell yeah, Australia, uh, what an ally. Uh, um, so trade exposed to China, mm. but willing to take some big bold steps. Now, now that gets to a very a very different nature of the relationship, Peter. Um, you said. You said we regard both Australia and Canada regard the United States as the most important relation. It's complicated for Australia. We would say yes, absolutely. The United States is our most important uh, uh, partnership, uh, but you know we run with this huge trade surplus with China, um, and that comes out of the mouth immediately. Come about, um, you don't even draw breath when you say, and you've got to say that to the United States all the time. And one thing I think the Australian government has been walking a bit of a tightrope between. Um, being able to assert and, and has found, I think has done it pretty successfully, um, has found a way to talk to the United States and say, hey, we, we don't run a trade deficit with China. We run a trade deficit with you mm-hmm. <laughs> in the United States. We're buying F-35s and Boeings and, and all, you know, and a ton of, you know, GE 3D printers and, and, and gas turbines and all that great stuff, high value uh, uh, manufactured stuff from from the US. We're able to do that because we were a resource exporter, a commodity exporter to China, iron ore and coal in particular, and agriculture, and increasingly higher ed uh, 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 accounting degrees uh, for the next generation of Chinese uh, accountants um, uh, being done. So it's a very it's it's really tricky, Peter. Um, but and so I think Australia comes. In taking some big bold steps on the security front, Australia is able to walk around Washington and navigate a Trump so much better than any other country, other than Israel and maybe Japan. I don't know of another country that handled Trump and the Trump administration better than Australia. And why? Because I think we were seen as being on the front lines with respect to China, number one. Um, and, and I think. I don't know what, you know, the Australian government has got increasingly sort of comfortable with exposing what China has been up to inside Australia, like just unrelenting cyber attacks on Mm -hmm. everything from the national parliament to big commercial interests to our weather, our our, our weather bureau, our national meteorological service to, to the intelligence agencies themselves. And that is increasingly being brought out into the open here and also sort of some of the um, buying off of politicians. Um, and I think that has, has been a twofold strategy, Peter. One, to bring the Australian people on a journey. And I think they've been quite successful on that. Um, but one thing, I think Australia's star is continues to rise in Washington because of that frontline allied status with respect to with China and and a, a small trade exposed country willing to take some bolts. So it's been a very different um, and, and Australia got an exemption from the steel and aluminum tariffs so, uh, that the rest of the world was subject to. Australia's had a very different relationship um, 
than 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 what I know of the Canadian uh, experience. Yeah, it's a very interesting juxtaposition, and 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 one has to think that at least part of it is due to the fact that Australia actually has more leverage with China than Canada does. You know, so I mean, I mean, Canada exports a lot to China. There's no doubt about it, right? I and mean, we do in some on, on some very important goods to them: pork, canola, some other things. Um, but Australia got that relationship sorted out a lot sooner than we did. You know, they 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 figured out back in back in the hot heating days that that they weren't that many flying hours from Beijing, and and we're actually not that many either. But it's taken us a bit longer. There's a there's a good question here, which is uh, from uh, Hao Bo Chen. It's even though the United States has repeatedly emphasized the importance of the U of the U.S. allies. We can still see a sense of economic protectionism yeah. in his in his in Biden's platforms. Yeah. How are we going to address the political economic tension? And I would yeah, just put that, the that, note on it that I mean, Biden is not a. There's there's really no evidence that Biden's a free trader, right? In his in his in his in his intuitions, um, he might just be a more effective protectionist. What's the? How do Canada and how do Australia and other allies navigate yeah, that tension? Yeah, no, it's a really it's a it's a, it's so where to start on that one. Look, I just think the other thing with COVID one, two, three, four, and five. This is not a good time to, you know, be opening up the U.S. economy to the, the the the, the winds of globalization. You know, I expect those will come off gradually. Um, some of those Trump tariffs, for economic reasons, perhaps, um, and but also strategic reasons. The the big one, but Biden's complicated on free trade. He he was really key in getting NAFTA over the line originally back in the nineties. Mm -hmm. um, and, and was part of this internationalist coalition, um, sort of this weird inside out coalition of, of Republicans and Democrats who were globalists and then McCain and Biden would come together and you'd have the outsides, um, Paul Wellstone or, or um, uh, Ted Kennedy on the left and, and um, God, the, uh, Ashcroft, you know, really, mm -hmm. really meat eating, you know, um, for whom it was about human rights or abortion rights, really, and, and you know, you know, finding reasons to oppose. But this the centrist coalition. So I think Biden would say to you privately, "Gee, we really messed up by not being part of the TPP. Mm. Um, we messed up." But I think coming back is so hard. I think it is so tough politically uh, inside the US with with COVID. <laughs> Um, I, I do don't hold your breath is the only thing I'd say on trade liberalization. Um, industry policy is back. Here's the other thing. All that stuff about the strategic environment. Um, there will be these strategic investments made in the American industrial technology base. We're going to come out. We're going to how are we going to do with China? Well, we're not going to just shut down. Um, we're going to make these. We're going to stand up. We're going to make investments in cyber, hypersonics, material science, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, all, all that stuff. And the government is going to be, and it's, it's tough for a US government to do that, but there will be sort of both carrots and sticks there. The sticks being, I think, those trusted supply chains are going to be avenues. Yes. With, and so that works, I think, okay for people like you and me around universities, uh, I think, you know, our, our colleagues in engineering departments are, are going to be fine. Um, but how that cashes out um, across the broader economy, um, I don't know, other than just the observation that the climate is not a good one for trade liberalization, uh, either geostrategically or, 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 or domestically. No, I think that's fair. I mean, I mean, the, the most the most reasonable characterization of the of the most recent NAFTA is that it really just creates a, a North American trading block. Right, you use tariffs to drive up imported car prices. You can build up, drive up content prices. It's it's a uh, it it almost was kind of a precursor to this sort of renationalization, reindustrialization policy. It works well for Canada, given how close we are to the U.S. It creates some problems for Australia, given the the cost of supply chains that are that are integrated. But we'll see how that we'll see how that one uh, we'll see how that one plays out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, let me let me ask you one more question, just yep. about about about. Um, I'm going to go a little bit off piste here, but I but I but I want to get your views on this. You know, it's just as we're giving this talk, it's just been announced that. Uh, Trump has uh, pardoned uh, Michael Flynn, uh, General Michael Flynn, a full pardon. So there you go. Um, he's a fine man, and he saw to it. Um, but what is the what do the next sort of three months look like for for uh, uh, both for a transition and for yeah. Biden trying to get off get off and running? And you know what kind of what kind of 
what horse would you bet on here if you were choosing between in the end an orderly transition and a return to a functional Washington or some real dragging, you know, real dragging through the uh, transition and then some dragging on confirmations and what do you, what's your uh, sense I, of where I, we're going to end up? That, on confirmations, I think the picks are pretty moderate and, and they'll go, they'll go through um, as, un, unless there's some landmine that we don't know about someone's one of these picks while they're out of government said something immoderate that really upsets, you know, will be dragged up by Republican senators or something. We'll see. But, but, um, but as I said, in my remarks, I think the confirmation, I, I, I don't expect a smooth transition though, between now I, there'll be more pardons and weirdness out of Trump who, who just, you know, I try to resist doing psychoanalysis from, you know, 10,000 miles. Um, and it's not my, my PhD is a political science, not psychoanalysis, but, um, but you just can't help but think the, the, the resentment and, and the egotism, he, he can't help but do or say something on the way out the door. And then there's real policy stuff. So firing ESPA, mm-hmm. firing the national cyber security person that said the election was secure, um, shutting down the US participation in this open skies program Mm -hmm. weird things like that like you know what the hell is going on and and um he is still commander-in-chief through to january 20 um but he's an egotist who is mightily bruised in a historically profound way it's going to be it's torture for him he's never going to concede i think um I, i you know i think i wouldn't put even money on him attending the inauguration i think it's less than even money he attends um um, um, so I wouldn't put some petulance, uh, pardons and pronouncements. Um, that the, the, there will be some curveballs, Peter. They can't help but be. Uh, or you'd be a fool not to expect. You know, if you're an allied government, mm-hmm. or you're in you're in um, either of our government's um, embassies in Washington, the cables you're sending home right now about what might to expect. Of course, you've got to have a big plus or minus around that. Um, you just hope that. And again, this is where I think the allies, the coordination going on among other allies, I think is really important. The day that Trump was elected, I think the second phone call that our foreign minister made was to Tokyo. It, it, it's the Australia-Japan relationship has, is, is an alliance in all but name only and, and went on steroids during the Trump years. And, and, and frankly, I think the Australian-Canadian relationship could benefit from some of the same. I, I agree very much, Simon. It's uh, it's always great to see you, but uh, but it's always uh, particularly great to get your get your insights on things. Um, it's really, uh, uh, you've got a great vantage point from Sydney. You're a long way away, but you can still see everything. It seems so. Well, that's uh, that's great. Thanks, thanks um, for the opportunity, Peter. Great great to talk with you and colleagues there. Yeah, let's have you back up. And thanks everyone who joined us. Uh, and uh, I'll just sign off and say uh, goodbye from the Monk School. Thank you.